together, my friends, grace, mercy, peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the one who goes through great lengths to get our attention. Amen. I've heard it said many times and in many different ways, something similar, but probably my best way of hearing it is when someone's stubborn, maybe hearing someone say about them, man, he's so thick in the head, so stubborn, so hard-headed that even a two-by-four to the back of his head wouldn't even start to move him from where he is. You ever heard someone say something like that? Two-by-four to the head wouldn't change his ways. I think we all have a little bit of that stubbornness in us. Some of it's built into us because we're human beings, uh, made in the image of God, but often falling far short of God's plan for us. And God sometimes says, batter up, because he wants to get our attention. He wants to push us away from something that's harmful. And sometimes he actually does something that shows us that he's on our side, that that bat or that two by four swings both ways. We have a God who defends us, but also chastens us. And we'll talk a little bit tonight about how God fights for us as we talk about Joshua 6 and the battle of Jericho. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. Some of you may recall the Will Smith movie from a few years ago called Hitch. It's about a guy who helps people get dates and then stay together and push aside some of their their social awkwardness so that they can actually function in a, in a relationship. And I remember one of the, the things that he said in his, one of these coaching sessions, he says, 90% of what you're saying isn't coming out of your mouth. Now, we talked a little bit uh, a little while ago, a couple weeks ago, about the Tower of Babel and how we're made in the image of God. And the best way I can approximate that is he's given us language to speak to others in more precise ways than our bodies can express. And we often, again, fall far short of using that well. And the people at the Tower of Babel did as well, so God confused their languages. But we still have the opportunity to communicate in a common way in the ways that, way the animals don't. At the same time, Body language does say a lot about what's going on internally. And while animals, I'm thinking dogs and cats, you know how that works? Like they may not understand your words very precisely, but if you look at them in a certain way, they, oh, okay, this is playtime, or oh, I better back off. You know how we, how we handle that ourselves that way? We're that way as well. So a posture like this is very different than a posture like this. You may have an idea of how I'm approaching things by the way my posture is. And I'm guessing you can understand what this means, right? Now just imagine, imagine if we were to take uh, four linemen from the Chicago Bears, O-line, D-line, you, you decide to put them right here. And then I were to say to all of us, okay, we need to get through there. How do you think that would work? In the words of Gandalf, their th re response would be, you shall not pass. It just wouldn't work. Now, why am I, I bringing all this up and putting linebackers in the sanctuary? Well, it's because this is the posture of Jericho. And God's people have to go through that to get to the place where he is, where he wants them to be, where he's promised them uh, to be their land and to bless them, the promised land. So in Joshua 6, we hear this story, this well-known Bible story about the battle of Jericho. Maybe you know parts of it. Joshua is freshly become the, the leader of God's people. He's been on the shoulder, been a disciple of Moses for 40 years, been taking notes, and now he's leading God's people into the promised land. They've crossed the Jordan River, and their first obstacle is Jericho. Now, this is not going to be an easy nut to crack, as the saying goes because it's a fortified city, and not just any fortified city. It is such a thick wall that people's houses are built into it. This is an impregnable fortress. Nobody's getting in there, except maybe something supernatural. And that's what God promises to his people. Now, you've probably heard the story. Joshua goes and inquires from God, says, how are we gonna do this? We can't get in there. No matter of military might is going to breach the city wall. So what do you want us to do? And God says, here's the plan. This improbable military strategy. 
I want you to walk around the city. Walk six days in a row. Just walk. All your assembled um, warriors, all of your mighty men of valor, and don't have them do a single thing but walk. Now, scholars tell us that Jericho is probably about 9 to 12 acres in size, which, if you do the math, ends up to be about a half mile to a mile in circumference. Now, you all have been maybe watching the Olympics. A mile is not a long distance to walk. Some people run it in under four minutes. So you can imagine that all of these soldiers probably were, some of them were finishing their lap each day, while the others were, were still queuing up to go around the city. It's not a long distance to go. So God says, go six days, one lap, and the last day something's going to happen. You're going to go seven times, and then when I tell you to shout, I'm going to fight the battle for you, and you're going to win. Now, I think it's easy to, to take this from Joshua's perspective and to hear him go to God and inquire and get this strategy and then carry it out. But I have to, we have to think about all those people who every day got up in the morning and said, Okay, it's time to go to war. What are we going to do today? We're going to walk again. We're going to get our swords and spears and shields out? Well, we're going to carry them, but are we going to do anything with them? Nope. So once again, one day, they make their lap. Day two, they make their lap. Day three, day four, they make their lap of Jericho. And what do they do then? Well, they do what any red-blooded human being does. They go back to their families and they say, You never figured out what happened at work today. I walked around a city. What happened? Nothing. You can imagine about day five or six, they're starting to say, I know there's going to be a plan in this, and we trust Joshua, we trust God, but really, nothing's happening. And it's all up the the way to the very end of this story. When the walls come tumbling down, that nothing happens. I've talked with some people recently who have been going through some really, really difficult things. Things that feel like Jericho to them. Things that they can't move. Something they, things they can't fix. Any number of things can fall into this category. I'm guessing you have some sort of Jericho. Whether it looks like a disease or a sickness for which there is no cure or a nagging something or other that doesn't feel right, whether it is uh, the way that you never can catch up with your bills, or how relationships are always strained or difficult with one person, or maybe two or three. I think we all have those things that seem impossible to us, that we face, that feel like looking at Jericho and saying, what are we supposed to do with this? And if you're like me, then I'm guessing you don't want to sit on your hands. You want to do something. Like, give me something to do. And I think we can do that same thing to God. Say, God, I want to do something here. I don't want to just sit around and wait for something to happen. I want to do something. I'm a man of action. Please, do something. Put me in the game, coach. I'm there. And God's message comes back. Sit tight. Wait. Your salvation is coming. Is that hard for you to hear? Just sit and wait? I know what it is for me. And yet, we face unsolvable problems and issues in this life that only God can fix, and he does. Probably not in the way that we would anticipate or that we would like always, but he always takes care of us. He always fights the battles that we can't possibly understand the way through. So if there were those four linebackers standing right there and God said, hang on, I got this, don't worry. Do you think that he could get me through those linebackers? You and me? Yeah? He, he'd part the Red Sea or he'd, he'd disappear them and make them uh, uh, appear on Soldier Field where they properly belong. There's, he would do something that would make that happen. Now, how did the, the walls of Jericho fall down? Seems like a pretty cinematic moment, doesn't it? If you imagine it. I think everybody imagines it in their own vision in a different way. But the walls come down and God's people win the victory. How did that happen? I don't know. We waited for God to show up. We trusted him and he did. He took care of us. He won the victory. I came upon a scripture earlier this week, part of the story of David. And David faces the same exact 
military situation in both of these stories, these two sections of the story, and each time he asks God the same question. God, what do you want me to do? And he phrases it like this. These Philistines that are in this valley, do you want me to go up and fight them, Lord? And the first time, God says, yes, I'm with you. Go and win the battle. So David does, and he wins the victory. The next time, the same exact situation, same scenario, God's, or David says to God, shall I go up against these Philistines? And this time God says, no, don't go up against them. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to circle back around behind them and hide in the trees, which I don't think most people, most soldiers would think is a very brave strategy. Go hide in the woods and watch, right? But this is what God says. Go hide in the woods behind them, and I'm going to go in front of you, and I'm going to win the battle, and then you'll see that I'm the one who's taking care of you. And you'll all just have to sweep up the spoils. So sometimes God gives us something to do, but sometimes, most times, I think, he says, just wait. Hang on. I'm coming. I'm going to take care of you. It's not going to be on your terms. It's not going to be on your timeline, but I'm going to take care of you. It's going to feel like a, a two-by-four to the head of us, to wait, but God's going to take a sledgehammer to that whatever that Jericho is. You know how I know this? Because there is one intractable problem, one Jericho that every human being faces in their life, and it's at the end of our life. We all have to have to face death. Nobody has ever solved it, whether through sorcery of some sort or medical science on the other side. Nobody's ever solved this problem. It's the unsolvable human dilemma. We can't solve it. I mean, I think a few people have sidestepped it. You have Enoch, who is just no more, but poof, he was gone. He didn't come back. We have people who have been raised from the dead. Lazarus, he comes back, but then he dies again. What a rum deal, huh? Uh, Jairus' daughter, same thing, the widow's son at Nain, all raised from the dead, still died. They're not around. Jesus is the only one who beat death and was seen last very much alive. And so much of what he says to us, the precious words of Jesus are, I am the resurrection and the life. Hitch your life to mine, and what happens to me happens to you. You're going to die someday, just like I did, for you on that cross, even though I could have avoided it. I'm going to bring you back to life. That Jericho that nobody can breach, I know how to do that. Stick on my six, and you're going to be okay. So when that moment comes where we have to face the thing that we can't fix, when we're forced to trust God, my hope and prayer for you and me is that throughout our life, there have been these moments where God has said, you trust me. you got to trust me. Here's a Jericho. Let me knock it down. And your heart has been trained by repetition to say, yeah, I trust you, God. I'm going to go with you. It's going to be okay. Yes, I trust you. Yes, I trust you. Yes, I trust you into the next life. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to trust him. Jericho wasn't a test of military might. It was a test of trust. And when we face that final test of Jericho, of death itself, we have a Savior who loves us, who fights for us, who died for us, and rose again, waiting on the other side to say, welcome home. You're in a good spot. Now, death's not a thing anymore. Hurt is not a thing anymore. Broken relationships aren't a thing anymore. Want isn't a thing anymore. There is just abundance and good and life eternal with nothing to ever harm it. Does that sound like good news to you? Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for giving us examples of people who trusted you, even though it didn't necessarily make sense to them, even though it might not have been the thing they wanted to do. We all face our moments where there's something we can't fix, can't change, can't win against. And we have to lay it before you. We have to put it in your almighty hands. We pray that we would trust you with our very lives and everything up to the end of our life, knowing that you can and will give blessings that we can't possibly imagine along the way and a final peaceful 
full, rich life when you call us home, to be with you always. Keep us trusting and hopeful in this promise of yours, that as Jesus lives, we also will live. We ask it in his name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts and your minds always in Christ Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Amen.